All right, well, thank you so much for coming to today's conservation education lunch and learn webinar series all about community science right here in Nebraska. Um, really excited to hear from community scientists across Nebraska, and uh, we have some great questions to discuss today. Um, before I introduce the host of the uh, webinar today, I'll just let you know my name is Amber Schultz. I'm the Assistant Division Administrator of the Fish and Wildlife Education um, Division here at Nebraska Game and Parks, and I facilitate this Conservation Education Lunch and Learn series. It's a once a month uh, virtual webinar where we try to talk about environmental education and conservation education topics and just advance um, advance that conversation across the state across partners as well. So we're really excited to be here today. I will be stepping back in my host role, but I will be monitoring uh, the chat. So if you have questions that come up, this is a panel discussion. Um, so it's more of a discussion than a presentation. If you do have questions that come up, throw them in the chat. I'll be watching them. We'll hope, hopefully be getting to most of the questions that we have. Um, and then at the end, um, we'll touch base again, but I'm going to give it up to the host today who's going to be hosting this panel discussion. So Allie, welcome and you can go ahead and take it over. Thanks, Amber. Hi, everyone. My name is Allie Mays. I'm the Community Science Education Specialist with Nebraska Game and Parks. Um, when Amber approached me about doing a community science uh, session for the speaker series. I was really pumped, but I was like, let's have other people speak this time. Let's um, bring on some other folks to share their knowledge and expertise. And so I gathered this panel together of um, people across Nebraska who both participate in community science on a facilitator side and also a community science side. And I'm really excited for them to share their stories today um, and their experiences about community science. Um, so to get started, I'm going to throw out the question to our panelists to please introduce yourself and tell us about how you engage with community science. Um, let's start with Katie. Hi, my name is Katie Lamke. I am a conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. I'm based in Lincoln, Nebraska. So I am a facilitator with community science, but I'm also a participant. Um, my job is to oversee the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, as well as the Bumblebee Atlas that goes on in four surrounding states. Um, but I also like to participate in stuff like BioBlitz and NestWatch and Christmas bird counts, all that kind of stuff too. All right, Colin, could you go next, please? Sure. Um, I'm Colin Croft. I'm an instructor at Western Nebraska Community College in Scotts Bluff, um, and I'm mostly involved on the participant side, I guess. I, I, I have an iNaturalist problem. Um, this uh, sounds like uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or something, but I kind of got hooked on it uh, during my Nebraska Master Naturalist training, which I highly recommend if you've not done it. It's just a wonderful opportunity to uh, engage with some Nebraskans, to learn a lot, and uh, it's just fantastic uh, to get knowledge and to share it. And I've helped facilitate a couple of smaller bio blitzes on that side as well. But uh, mainly as a participant and I just really enjoy it. I learn a lot and sometimes I'm shown to be wrong and mistaken which I think is always a good thing. It's a humbling thing and it keeps our egos in check. So uh, of the many values of citizen science particularly at a time when truth and facts seem to be uh, under, I would say, attacks too strong of a word, maybe not. Uh, it's a very good forum to keep focused on facts and evidence and get thoughtful and enthusiastic people to weigh in on uh, nature. And so I just uh, find it really fascinating. Great. Thank you, Colin. Um, Cody, can you go next, please? Hi, everyone. I'm Cody Dreyer. I'm the pollinator ecologist for Nebraska Game and Parks. My primary duty is to run our community science project looking at monarchs and regal fritillaries, um, but I also help out with um, the Bumblebee Atlas, uh, Monarch Watch Project, Monarch Health. Um, a lot of pollinator science right now is community science based. So um, yeah, I'm kind of a paid community scientist in some regards. So it's, it's a pretty good gig. Thank you, Cody. Um, Han, would you go next? Hi, everyone. I'm Han Lee. I am a new assistant professor at University of Nebraska, Omaha, so you can see my background. Um, I moved here in July this year. 
Um, so everything is new in Nebraska to me, everything, literally everything. Before this, I was in North Carolina overseeing a statewide long-term bat monitoring program, which is called North American Bat Monitoring Program, short for NABAT. I will bring that word NABAT again and again, I'm sure, today. Um, Basically, in the past seven years, I started this effort for the state of North Carolina. Particularly in 2019, I started a statewide NAVAP-based community science program, long-term community science program. That's how I started working with education specialists as well as community scientists. And now I'm new to Nebraska, starting my research lab here. Um, one of my goals is to start a backyard community science program of bat monitoring, maybe bat and other biodiversity components. So that's why I'm here, sort of to advertise my research. Great, thank you, Han. Kelly? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kelly Hayden. Um, I've kind of had both roles in community science, um, just as a facilitator and a participant. Um, so I am a communication specialist full-time for a career. Uh, this summer, it kind of sounds crazy, but I worked uh, two full-time jobs technically um, in communications, but then I had a, a second job as a bumblebee technician with the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas. Um, and then as far as being a participant in community science goes, um, gosh, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of everything. I wrote it down and I don't think it's everything. <laughs> um, Let's see, so I guess primarily um, I do independent research uh, with raptor banding, both in Iowa and Nebraska. Um, I banned raptors during fall migration. So that's kind of just taken my world by storm for the next eight weeks or so. Um, I also do uh, some work with studying breeding owls in West Nebraska. Um, a lot of my time during the summer is volunteering for the Nebraska Bumblebee Atlas, but then I also do smaller initiatives like the Monarch and Milkweed monitoring, uh, Monarch tagging, water quality testing, uh, bio blitzes, winter raptor survey, Christmas bird count. Yeah, I think that might be everything. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. Well, thank you to everyone who um, joined us today on the panel. And we have a list of questions. We'll do our best to get through. A few of these questions are from our audience. And then also, like Amber said earlier, if you have questions as we go along, please enter them into the chat and we'll just try to get to as many as we can. Um, so next question to our panelists, please define community science in your own words. I can start with this one. Um, I guess I kind of see the phrase as like two-pronged in some ways. Um, I see it as science being completed or conducted by a non-career individual, but then also I see it as science that is practiced by a community. Um, so I really do like the phrase community science because it does put the emphasis on this, especially like those smaller initiatives turning into something larger, really being community events. I like that. I'll add another maybe take on it, uh, maybe crowdsource knowledge, crowdsource science. Um, and I've got an example from real life um, where I live. Mountain lions have been a part of the landscape probably since the 1990s. There's a healthy population. Uh, a resident found a mule deer carcass in the road that by most indications looked like a mountain lion kill site. And so um, I shared with our residents about that, tried to inform them a little bit, and I posted it up to iNaturalist, and it didn't take too long before several uh, very um, qualified trackers and mountain lion experts uh, said, no, 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 this is not a mountain lion kill site, and they pointed out a number of different things, and it was just phenomenal. It wasn't phenomenal being wrong, but to my point before, it's a good thing there. Uh, and I was able to follow up with the uh, residents and say, likely deer died of natural causes and a canine 
um, scavenged it, and um, it was just a wonderful process. And I can't imagine that working out any other way. So it's a wonderful way for experts to weigh in and for us to focus on facts and evidence and get a good answer where everyone learned a little bit uh, in the process. So I think that crowdsource function can be a valuable one. Yeah, and on top of that crowdsource, it seems like everybody that participates has some sort of shared interest. You know, sometimes it's on iNaturalist specifically, you know, it might be people that like to take nature photography or, you know, maybe it's people that like to record all of these species on their account. Or maybe it's they like going out with their family and learning something new about the environment. Like something is all bringing these people into this project. And with some more specific ones, like when I look at the Bumblebee Atlas, it's almost like shared morals that you find in these people because they're drawn to a project for some reason. And maybe that's they want to help pollinators. Maybe that's they want to learn about what plants they can use to support the species around them. Like there's always some sort of shared aspect in the people that are drawn to these projects. My answer is pretty short. Um, it's publication-worthy research done by volunteers. Um, and I think the publication-worthy is a really important point to hit on um, so that the volunteers aren't wasting their time. Um, I've seen some community science projects that just end up on a shelf somewhere and nobody's ever going to look at it. And um, I think that's a discredit to what the volunteers are giving um, and what the quality of the research is so um, I think publication worthy really needs to be in there. I actually would like to elaborate a little bit from where what Cody just said. Um, as a scientist myself, a professional paid scientist perspective, to me, um, community science are volunteers involved in the scientific method, scientific inquiry process. process. Um, but what I particularly want to emphasize is that community scientists, even though they are volunteers, non-professional, not paid, they can be involved in many parts, many steps of the scientific methods. And I think as a community together, um, especially people from academia, I think we have been seeing this as a method to collect data. We look at uh, free labor, large data sets. But my past experience in North Carolina showed me that actually a lot of community scientists, they can be involved in other parts, including asking questions, including answering questions, including even educating others, sharing the knowledge, scientific knowledge to a broader community, bring things back to their own community. I think that's what I would like to emphasize. Great, thank you, Han. And that leads us really nicely into our next question. This one's specifically for the facilitators. What has your motivation been to incorporate community science as a part of your research or program? I'll go first. Um, a big thing for me when I started was just to keep the cost down. Um, it is a huge pain for Game and Parks to hire anybody. Um, so if we don't have to hire people, it makes life easier. Um, we knew we needed a lot of data for um, the Monarch Regal survey. Um, and now if I can keep community science involvement high, I should be able to run this project um, with only a few months of my time dedicated to training volunteers and analyzing data. Um, which will let me start up other research needs, um, which might also use community scientists. So um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, from Xerxes' side of things, it's similar to where Han left off in that education piece, right? Education is crucial in conservation um, because if people don't know what the problem is or how to help, it's gonna be really hard to move forward at various levels, you know, whether you're at policy or science, or maybe you're just starting with your own lawn or your patio plants. Um, without education or knowing what's going on, it's hard to take action. And so 
part of what Xerces does with our community science projects is hold those educational trainings to teach people not only the protocol for the projects, but also about the organism. So we go over a bumblebee species ID and how these organisms function in the environment. What are their nesting habitats like? What are their foraging preferences like? To give people a deeper connection to the organism that they're actually working with. Because when you feel connected to something, it makes you want to help more, right? It gives you more of a reason to get involved with the project. And I think that's when that information really starts to spread from neighbor to neighbor or to your friends and family is when you feel that connection or you feel like, you know, this is important to you all of a sudden and you have ways that you can take action on that. Thank you, Katie and Cody. Han, did you want to add anything? Um, I think Cody said quite a lot, really exact points for us, like as a scientist, there's no way to really collect data at a scale, especially spatially, how broad sometimes to like, like say if I want to know everything about Nebraska, um, if I want to get to the other side of Nebraska, I have to drive for, I don't know, I've never been to that part of Nebraska, six, seven hours. But if I have um, volunteers from that part, a lot of things can be done, and especially using the word volunteering for free. Um, that's definitely a huge benefit for scientists. Um, but also I think from like the grant money perspective, um, all my research is supported by either the state government or the federal government. So technically it's a taxpayer's money. So um, really, I think important, very important component on my side is to demonstrate my work to the general public. And I think Katie also mentioned that education component is quite important. So using community science approaches is probably the best way to reach out to a very broad audience. And based on my experience, honestly, I think really explaining how science works, like unless you have a science degree, I suppose most of people don't remember how, what scientific method is, what steps involved, exactly how science works. Well, through this community science, I think is a great way to either refresh memory or teach people how it works. Not magic, there's no potion, no spell. Thank you, Han. Um, next question is for participants of community science or community scientists themselves. Um, what has been the motivation to participate in community science projects? So um, I'd say that one of my motivations isn't unique by any means, um, but it's just wanting to contribute to something larger. Um, really enhancing understanding of organisms in general. Um, kind of one of the more humorous aspects of my motivation is that I want to be able to handle wildlife, um, but also do it in an ethical way that's not necessarily just selfishly me just wanting to handle birds. <laughs> um, I also noticed I've just been having so many questions that just float around in my head um, that do apply to just that scientific inquiry process. Um, and so it's like, as soon as I participate in one project, I start to have questions about other aspects of, you know, some kind of biosphere or the ecology of a system. Yeah, I'd echo what Kelly said about the questioning, and uh, it's just fun and fascinating, um, and one thing leads to another, and uh, I think it's sort of a structured way to experience nature and keep a good record. Um, I know my memory's never been great, and it's not getting better as I get older, um, so it's a good way to kind of remember what things I've seen where, and with platforms that are so user-friendly like INAT, it's very easy to see, and maybe you start to pick up some patterns and so it's I think very useful for that too. Um, as 
as a participant that is also running a project, um, I didn't know a lot about pollinators when I started this job. So I hopped on with a few existing projects that needed Nebraska data. Um, so just so I could learn what I could about um, running a community science project and um, learning about pollinators. So um, yeah, just throw that out there too. Yeah, I would jump on that too. Um, I am a list maker. I like to write down all the different species that I can find. And I don't, I should say, I didn't know very much about birds. And when the pandemic hit and I had a window to look out of, um, my partner who was a birder signed me up for Nest Watch, where I could sit at home and learn all of these local species of birds, which at first was intimidating to me because I didn't know what I was looking for. I didn't know that there were different beaks and different feet and different feathers. Um, but as I started just looking at those different species and all the things that you can notice, it was really fun for me. It became addicting, like Colin said, to to either take pictures of things or listen to things or just keep that that list running of what you're learning about. Thank you for sharing. Um, I guess kind of building off of that, we had a question from the audience. Um, what keeps you coming back and motivated to participate in community science from either the facilitator side or the participant side? So I guess this might sound kind of funny and maybe it sounds like I need to like get out and do other things more. Um, but just like during raptor banding or when I'm doing a bumblebee survey, like I've kind of noticed that like that first bumblebee or that first bird that I catch the day, I get a little bit of like adrenaline from that. <laughs> so it's just like that initial excitement in the morning um, of like getting that first organism on the survey. And then um, just really being able to go in depth and collect this data that does have those direct implications for these larger questions that we're asking. Um, that's really what keeps me coming back. Thank you, Kelly. Anybody else? Also, Kelly, I totally know that feeling that, yeah, it's a good feeling. Can you repeat the question, Allie? Of course. Um, what keeps you coming back and motivated to participate in community science? I, I think it is fun. Um, I don't, I think everybody here would agree that um, those that have done the projects, I hope you've had fun at least. Um, I've had quite a few volunteers that keep coming back year after year. So I hope they're having fun. I hope it's not a slog for them. Um, I've enjoyed the projects that I've helped with. Um, I might like doing the Bumblebee Atlas more than my survey. I don't know. Maybe don't tell my boss that. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of cool projects out there. Um, and the, especially if you're on this, uh, on this webinar, there's probably a project out there for you. So um, I encourage you to take a look and see what you have in your area and do mine. Yeah, Cody, and to the audience, we will um, provide some of those resources to find community science projects in the email you receive after um, after the webinar. Well, and to go back to one of Cody's earlier points about publishable data, uh, it's been fun to, uh, when you get your information out there, um, I've had people from, you know, the East Coast say, oh, I see that you found a Maximilian sunflower and we're doing some DNA tracking and can you go back to Sheridan County and find that and I couldn't but uh, and I was collecting milkweed beetles this summer some you know entomologists said hey we're doing these and so I'm there on the highway trying to and I found it's not so easy to ship milkweed beetles that are going to survive a trip to Cambridge Massachusetts from western Nebraska so it's neat to be able to plug into research by real paid scientists like Han and several of you uh, to their projects and think that maybe you're contributing in a small way. And so I do think it's a neat way to connect up people in that regard too. So that's a motivator for me. Colin, I, I would just say that it's not a small way. Um, I've had volunteers that have done like 
a a tenth to a fifth of what I can do in a summer. That's not small. That's I have a really specific survey window. I can do as much as I do. And without volunteers, the project would not be what it is. So don't think your contributions are small, especially if you're trying to ship beetles across the country. That's <laughs> right. That's thousands of dollars. It's a, that's a secret between you and I, not FedEx, but uh, I think okay. I violated yeah. some rule or regulation somewhere. But the beetles, I am told, when, and apparently the type of DNA research they were doing, because I'm like, well, you can do that on a dead specimen. No, they were doing some that they needed a fresh, they needed freshies. And so uh, I took a couple of shots and I apologize to the beetles that were uh, lost along the way, but we did our best. Well, I think that's a unique skill for your resume that nobody else will have, Colin. And these days it might be the most valuable. Yeah. I don't know. It might be one day, if not today. Um, but yeah, those those observations and contributions are not small. There have been some people that have maybe only submitted one or two bumblebee observations, but maybe that's a species that we haven't seen yet in the project. Like I know somebody on this call found a cuckoo bee just by happenstance and submitted it. And that was amazing because we've only found two cuckoo bees in three years. Um, but I think going back to the original question of what motivates you and keeps coming back, besides the projects being fun and contributing valuable data, is the people that you meet. You know, whether it's through the Nebraska Master Naturalist or the Bumblebee Atlas or the Monarch Project, you're meeting people that are interested in something that you are and want to help the earth in one way or another. And, you know, sometimes you meet people that are there from the artsy side of things, right? There's a lot of intrinsic value in taking photographs or doing watercolor. Sometimes it's people like Kelly who want to get up and close and personal with the actual specimens. And, you know, if the bee stings you, it's okay. But getting the chance to be close with the wildlife is really exciting for them. So there's a lot of different and lovely people that you can meet through community science. I, I guess I have a different story to share, a little bit different, um, more like an experiment than from, I guess, the fun or contribution side. We, um, we try to, in, like in North Carolina, we try to involve community science li scientists a little bit more than just collecting data or contributing observations. We actually try to distill, that's the best word I can come up at this point, distill the questions they have. I think either Kelly or Katie mentioned all those questions they have as they're doing things. So I, I think all the community science are probably the same across the entire continent. When they do things, they observe and they find questions. And what we tried is to have, we asked them to write down those questions and send back to us. And then going over all those questions, find similarity, we actually identified one question that had really has not been addressed by scientists. So, well, of course, you have to elaborate, use more precise way to describe the question, but eventually, after the first year of community science work, we came up with a question that inherently asked by community scientists. And then from there, I took over, start doing, um, I, I consider myself a statistician sometimes, got into that side of science. I started playing with numbers, making graphs, but also at the, in the same process, we keep all our community scientists involved. So we constantly hold those meetings, like periodically we host meetings with them to feedback to them. Like including showing them graphs we have made, asking their inputs on which one they think explain things better. So while well, that's actually is turning into a manuscript, hopefully we can send it out next year with me moving there. A lot of things I had to put on stop, but it is actually happening. So from my side, I see, I think involving community scientists in other steps besides data collection of community science. It's a really good way to keep them coming back. I guess the retention, that's the word we like to use in academia, 
keep your student retention rate, your volunteer retention rate, and that's how we retain them. Well, that's really cool. I One of the courses I teach is in critical thinking, and the research shows us that every community has its biases and its limitations in thinking, including scientists. And um, there's a fair amount of research that indicates that even though you may be familiar with the scientific method, you're not necessarily thinking about your thinking within the scientific method. And so I think what Han you're describing is really the upper level of community science where maybe you get someone who asks a question that that researcher had a blind spot to. That's really the focus of critical thinking today. It isn't so much logical fallacies or the things we used to focus on, but cognitive biases. Everyone has them and trying to be aware of them and overcome them, boy, it seems like that would really improve the quality of the questions being asked and ultimately uh, the conclusions that are reached. So that's really neat to hear. Great, thank you. Um, we're gonna we're gonna ask a question. We're gonna switch it up and ask a question from the chat. Um, from Aaron, thoughts and advice on land managers integrating community science into their work. So does anybody have any suggestions or ideas for Aaron to in, um, integrate community science into land management? Well, Bumblebee specific, um, using the community science data from the Bumblebee Atlas between 2019 and 2021, we smushed all of that together, did some analyses, and came out with a document to guide land managers on how to support and manage bumblebee habitat across the state. So it includes plant lists for four of Nebraska's main ecoregions, and it addresses haying, grazing, mowing, fire, um, managed bees. So is that kind of what you're asking, Erin, or are you asking how to get community scientists involved with land management? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh no. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I was just thinking, like, I mean, we've worked together on stuff before, and I just wondered, like, for other land managers who watch this in the future, I guess, or any other land managers on the call. So yeah, basically that what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, are we talking public land too? I know several of you involved here uh, have heard me say I'd love to see, and I know the folks, particularly within the education division, Nebraska Game and Parks, are putting more emphasis here. I'd love to see our public land areas specifically focus on the wildlife viewing and community science side, not just sort of the traditional consumptive activities uh, that have been the focus there. And I, I think that's where our surveys say many people are, and I think that's a good chance to engage and to really be inviting, not just that it's allowed, but, you know, you go to a lot of these places and it's like, you know, open to hunting. It'd be great to see and wildlife viewing or community science. So I think for public land managers, I'd sure like to see uh, more of an emphasis there, too, because we've got some great resources there. Yeah, thank you for that, Colin. Um, I just wanted to chime in real quick. Um, so one of the uh, projects that I've participated in um, in Iowa, technically, so not Nebraska related, but um, they have a bio blitz annually. And so they actually provide all of the uh, information that we get from those bio blitzes to the land managers every year. Um, and just because I'm there so much, like I'm there 13 hours a day sometimes. So I talk to the land managers and they really do use that information. Um, they're able to see kind of like what's missing, um, what should be there, but isn't really um, when they're working on these restoration projects. So that seems to be what one thing that has just been really helpful to them that anyone can really participate in, especially if they're using iNaturalist. Well, and you'd think this would be very useful to land managers, especially that are grant funded or are seeking making uh, donor pitches, if they could leverage 
community science data, to me, that just lends itself to either a grant application or some of those funding pitches where it can say, hey, folks on the ground are implementing this, they're observing this. And so I think the land manager has a, a real interest in encouraging this as well, because it would be, I think, a very effective way to continue to have support and build support for the land they're managing. Great, thank you. Um, next question, how has your understanding of community science changed since you first heard of or started engaging with it? I'll go first, because this is a long debate within my professional world, um, whether we should or should not really incorporate community science into our research are really, um, I think another aspect is whether community science contributes quality data for scientists. Um, well, I did not know much about it. Um, when I started incorporating it into my own research, um, really important component is what I, I discovered that I, as a scientist, I have skills, my own skills, but there's really a skill set more or less missing from my perspective. Like as a, I'm an educator, I, I teach students, but this kind of college university instruction is not sufficient to really make my project, community science project take off, honestly. Um, I found people like, Ali, Amber, or all of you who work in communication, that component is essential for community science. I think a lot of times there are people, scientists say it doesn't work, community science doesn't work, community science data not useful for research, stuff like that. I, I, I often think they probably did not get the right communication collaborators, because I, I really need help from the people who do communication to really connect to very broad audience. So that's one thing I discovered or how I see community science change over time. I just wanted to chime in on that real quick. Um, over the summer, just being a bumblebee technician and being more uh, public facing in that sense, um, I totally agree, like communication is just essential for getting that quality data. Um, one thing that I found especially helpful in communicating protocol for the Bumblebee Atlas was explaining the why, like, okay, why are we taking this data? Why are we doing this in this specific way? I found that it really enforces and like just puts those connections together. Um, and in addition, it just really enforces that the data that they are taking is accurate. Well, just a real quick kind of hands-on example, I've helped a couple of high school instructors who were thinking about doing bio blitzes as part of a graded uh, project. And uh, a lot of those go south really fast because they're not thought out very well. And it becomes basically a contest of students to post the most photos they can, and they're usually of really poor quality. And so one of the things we talk about is making clear to the students that the goal is not just the total number of observations, but the number of confirmed or verified research grade observations, which requires, for example, not just taking a picture of a giant tree, which in most cases is probably not going to help, but maybe that and that close up of that leaf or that fluorescence or whatever it is. And so that that can really help. So that way the students understand and explain, boy, this might eventually end up in some type of scientific research. And so you really want to focus on a quality photograph and maybe some verbal description there. And so that can help clean that up. And I know that's on a very different level than Han's talking about, but it's getting at this notion of, are you producing something that's quality and that's useful? Yeah, and I think that's a great point, Colin, because um, there are these different levels, right? There's project specific, but there's also these platforms like Zooniverse or iNaturalist or eBird, where you know the ask is very different and the purpose is very different. So, great point, Colin. I All think right. that oh, is on sorry, a different Cody. level. 
Um, I don't think that is on a different level because I do go through all the pictures that I get from volunteers and double check what plants they have. And if they had a question on it, I send it off to our botanist. Um, so when I first heard of community scientists, um, I was skeptical of the data quality at the start. Um, then I thought it was a great way to essentially get free labor. Um, and now I'm kind of in the middle because uh, I've, I've done the work to vet all of the things that are coming into me now. Um, it's a great way to get uh, data during a limited field season, but it does require a lot of time on the back end to make sure that that is quality data. Um, so that it's it's worthy of being published. Okay. Um, what are tips to get people involved that do not have much experience or even interest in science? Fun facts. I feel like when tabling at outreach events, if you have a, if I were to bring a specimen box of different insects, the kids will come up and they'll be super interested and the parents will be like, ew, don't touch that. And so at that point, it's like, you got to kind of talk to the parent about, hey, don't demonstrate that to the kids. They think this is cool. But you know, there's interest. And once you share something like, did you know there's 20,000 bees in the world? No idea. So just sharing little bits of information that people have no idea about or haven't thought about can often generate a tiny amount of spark. I guess um, this is kind of just sharing my background on uh, how community, community science has just taken my world by storm completely in the past five years. Um, so four years ago, I went to a bird banding demonstration. I had been kind of interested in uh, science and birds in particular. Um, I had been working a full-time job and it just wasn't possible to pursue a biology degree at the time. So I went into communications instead. But at this banding demonstration, I, I was mind blown. I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And so at the end of the program, um, I just started asking probably too many questions too fast. I was like, how do I get involved? How do I get permits to do this? What kind of training do I need? And the guy just kind of calmly asked, like, well, do you just want to band with my group? And so I'd say as far as tips to getting involved, um, going to events that you even have mild interest in, um, just going to that single event has changed the course of my life drastically. But then um, as far as facilitators of community science goes, just making sure to be inviting to people who are especially interested. Um, I just, I keep looking back at that event, especially lately. And a lot of people in bird banding are not necessarily that welcoming. So it's just, it's kind of amazing like how many opportunities I could have missed in my life had that person not been welcoming to me. And I would just like to speak on Kelly a little bit more. Like, I think she is a really like wonderful example of how just an interest, right? She had an interest in bird banding. She got involved with the Bumblebee Atlas and we were able to hire her this summer to help us facilitate the Bumblebee Atlas. And so she didn't have a degree in that, but you know, she contributed so much time and effort and learned all of these things on her own that she was then able to get a position in that while it was temporary, but you know, that's gonna be huge in the future. Well, I just add that these platforms, I think are designed so well uh, compared to what was available even just five, 10 years ago, that it really, uh, there's not a very high barrier to entry. I mean, ideally what Kelly describes is what we should do, but I know from my teaching perspective, especially post COVID, there are huge issues a lot of our students are dealing with. Um, they're uncomfortable going places, not all of them, um, but any platform that allows you to kind of uh, learn on your own and go out and maybe just take a couple of quick photos. You've got a uh, easy to use streamlined app. 
um, there really is not a lot of uh, barrier to entry there. So I think that's really helpful. I mean, uh, eBird and iNaturalist particularly, um, you don't have to spend a lot of uh, time. Maybe that leads you to be interested enough to attend that bird banding session or whatever, but it's nice that these platforms and the good tutorial videos and all the rest of it can allow a person to get up and running pretty easily on their own, on their own time, and then maybe build that comfort and confidence level. And then maybe they take that next step to connect up at some of those events. So I give a lot of credit to the designers and the people who keep these platforms updated and going because they've just put a lot of good thought into it. All right, thank you. Um, next question. What is one challenge you have faced in participating or facilitating community science? I have a long answer, so I don't know if anyone wants to go first. I would love to hear your answer, Kelly. Okay. Um, so one short answer is having easy access to equipment. Um, so one thing that's been really helpful with the Bumblebee Atlas is that the equipment is pretty easy to get hands on. Um, there are some other community science initiatives that I've really wanted to participate in, but just the financial barrier to entry has been higher. Um, gosh, I can't remember of any specific examples, but there were like some dip nets that I wanted for um, like some fish monitoring. And I looked online, maybe I was looking at the wrong spot, but like a dip net was like $150. <laughs> and it's just, I can't really swing that unless I save up that amount of money. Um, I'd say my long answer. Um, so I technically, I have an invisible disability it fluctuates from day to day. Like I'm feeling pretty good today. I really don't know how I'm going to do tomorrow. Um, and kind of paired with that, uh, it is an autoimmune disease. So I am on an immunosuppressant now. So one thing that's kind of been a challenge for me in some sense is just the rollback of COVID per, uh, precautions. Um, it's, I started this immunosuppressant basically when all the precautions were lifted. So it was just horrible timing. But uh, as a facilitator in that sense, um, I am sub-permitted for sawwet owls. So I'm basically running a sawwet banding station. And so there's kind of just that power dynamic that comes with that where I can say, okay, well, you have to be vaccinated and you have to keep up to date with your COVID boosters and your flu shots. We can also say that to some extent because of highly pathogenic avian influenza. Um, we really can't have anyone there who could catch avian influenza as well as the human flu at the same time. That would basically breed new COVID of sorts. Um, but I just, I think about how I have the power to kind of put those precautions in place for me. But if this had been three years ago, I wouldn't have really had that same power dynamic. And that would have been just an immediate barrier to entry for me. Thank you for sharing that, Kelly. Uh, engagement. At least here in Western Nebraska, the few bio blitzes I've been involved with, uh, unfortunately, the volunteers and the facilitators have outnumbered the community scientists. And so, but this isn't unique to community science uh, here at the college. Um, things really have changed in the last couple of years, and it's a struggle to get students, and I mean students across the age range, um, and uh, the jury's still out why there's that uh, engagement. There's obviously a lot of stress in society and all, you know, Kelly touched on this as well. So it, it's a struggle to get folks to show up, <clears throat> excuse me, to some of these events, and I'm not sure how we get through that, but that continues to be a challenge, I think, from the facilitator side is to get people <laughs> You can only lean on your family and friends so much before uh, you run out of family and friends, maybe, but we need to expand that and bring more people in. But engagement, uh, particularly in lower populated areas of the state, is a challenge, I think. Yeah, it seems like this year, especially, um, people emotionally are just maxed out in a way that I haven't really experienced before. 
But I think the interesting thing is, and I know a couple of you have focused on this, Amber and others, um, I think nature, it's not, a, I won't say a cure, but I think it provides a number of things that can really, um, and maybe we need to do sort of more explicit focus on that. I don't know if that breaks through, but I think it's a lot of the things that can happen in community science, in nature, can really help with some of these things. And so, uh, but getting people out to take those first few steps is the challenge, I think. Yeah, good point, Colin. I think those multiple points of entry is really important. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. We only have about nine minutes left. Um, so I would really like to hear how has community science connected you with other people and or the natural world. I guess I can start. Um, I feel like I already allotted to this with one of the earlier questions, but the people that you meet through community science projects or the Master Naturalist program or you know some other nature-based program going on in the state, it's just incredible. Like there are people that participate in the bumblebee atlas from Lincoln and Omaha that will plan their vacations around doing bumblebee surveys across the state and they find these beautiful places in the state and they find new species of flower not new but new to them right they're seeing new things for the first time because they have a different set of glasses on they're out there looking for bees and so they're discovering new things that they haven't seen before and hearing the excitement and the stories that come back with that is really wonderful um, because I think in my role, right, I'm a conservation biologist, which means my job is funded by our human species continuing to do habitat loss and destruction and everything else that we're contributing to. Like, it's very easy to feel the weight of the earth, but through community science, you meet all of these wonderful people that remind you that there are individuals that want to help and want to support the earth. So it's, it's a wonderful community to be in. No, yeah, just kind of bouncing off of what Katie said, um, I've really enjoyed getting to know this community um, and just meeting more uh, just like-minded individuals who are equally motivated. Um, I've really enjoyed getting to know the people who just like go all in like as much as I have to the spectrum of people who are contributing and yet they still have other hobbies, which is just really cool to see the spectrum of contribution. Um, one thing that's been really interesting too that I've noticed is that I have a lot more cross-generational connections. Um, five years ago, if you had told me I would be hanging out with like a 73 year old five days a week, like I wouldn't have believed you by any means, but because I am a Raptor banding apprentice, um, that's who I'm learning from. So that's one thing that I've just really enjoyed, uh, just having those connections. All right, next question. Um, this one's from the audience. What do you consider to be the most valuable contributions of community scientists to the mission of conservation? It's a big question, but I'm excited to hear your answers. I can't remember which of you mentioned it earlier, but uh, it was basically the point of using community science to uh, educate and engage. And to me, conservation fundamentally comes down to raising awareness and developing uh, either a passion or a connection to nature that you want to do something about it. And so um, I think that community science really connects up to conservation, capital C, in, in that sort of way. We need more people engaged in it. And I think particularly people that don't have as much access to natural places, um, it's going to excite and interest them. And even if they're in a part of the state where there maybe isn't as much, say, public access, uh, natural places, there's a lot right in their neighborhood, and it might encourage them to go to those places. And so I think making that connection, because uh, ultimately it comes down to people wanting to do something about conservation, but you got to be aware and excited and value it to begin with. 
Yeah, thank you, Colin. Anybody else? I think definitely the knowledge. You never ignore the small contribution or large contribution you make and eventually lead to the knowledge that we can practice conservation in better, more efficient, more effective ways. And I think Colin mentioned that the ownership of nature, the stewardship towards nature, that's something. And becoming an active member of the community, I think, taking care of the place, the planet you live through the process. I think that's really big contribution for community science. Yeah, kind of building off that stewardship piece, Han, um, question for everyone. Has your daily habits or stewardship actions changed as a result of your involvement with community science projects? I guess this is yeah. really, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I don't have a long answer for this, but I think, yes, with all the people that you meet through these projects, your daily habits are bound to change from thoughts and perspectives. Um, but also things like when you get signed up for Nest Watch randomly, and then sooner or later you start putting bird pots out and then feeders, and you're trying to attract all the different species of birds that you can. Absolutely. Uh, pollinators, thanks to several of you right here. I mean, I, I've never been against them, but I'm doing proactive things now to end the great ideas that are shared, um, not just community science, but Game and Parks and others, uh, a real social media presence. So it's pollinator month and you're going to go out and, you know, build some solitary bee uh, housing, if you will. And so those are all good. Once you know about it, you want to try that project out. And so absolutely. Yeah, I guess I just wanted to add. Um, so my interest in birds did not start with raptors. Um, I'd say even three years ago, like someone would point out a raptor and I'd just be like, okay, it's a big bird. Um, but now that I've just had more time, like especially just handling like a red tailed hawk, there's nothing like it. And so my daily habits now, like I notice when I drive, like I really have to pay attention to the road even because I'm just like looking at what Raptor is on the telephone pole, you know? Um, so it is just very strange how like what I pay attention to and uh, how my thought process have changed so fundamentally. Yeah. They need a bumper sticker that says like I naturalist driver or <laughs> you know bumblebee watch driver or something. They and do have them for break for birding. Yeah. Okay, exactly. And you become the All worst hiking or biking partner because you're always stopping to look at something and take a photograph. So you're quickly removed from those group hiking lists, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay. last question for the panelists. What would you like the future to hold for community science in Nebraska? And maybe just a, I don't know, Allie, if you want kind of a quick elevator speech last question or last answer, since we just have about a minute left. I'll do this mm -hmm. as quick as possible. Um, I think the Bumblebee Atlas is a fantastic blueprint for designing more ComSci initiatives. So seeing more like that would be great. Um, I would also like to see in uh, initiatives where wildlife is being handled, uh, the North American Banding Council, they have a, a bird banding code of, ethic, code of ethics. Um, I would just really like to see that reflected more in those initiatives too. Um, I'd also just say more and continued, ex ex oh my gosh, accessibility for uh, disabled people. Um, kind of what uh, Han was alluding to, just including people who might not be able to get out into field work in those other parts of the scientific inquiry process, I think are especially important. I just want more people to be involved in my bad research. Just make it simple. More help, please.
I think we as professional scientists underestimate the number and the willingness of community scientists to participate and contribute to our work and to their own projects as well. Um, most of the butterfly experts in the state aren't paid scientists. They're community scientists that have just picked up butterfly knowledge over the years. So, um, yeah, and uh, more people to help me would be great too. Um, but also all the other projects, um, like Kelly said, there my project is not for everybody. Um, it's relatively physically taxing. Um, whereas tagging monarchs um, for Monarch Watch or taking OE samples for Monarch Health is something you can stick your kids on the butterflies and then they bring them back and you stick the stickers on. Um, there's there's a project out there for everybody. So I think we just need to increase our numbers. Um, I think from a facilitator side, I think more recognition to all of the community scientists that are participating is needed. I think that's a really important part of a successful project is you know saying thank you and giving reward in some fashion to everyone that's participating because we wouldn't be able to do all of this research without everybody who's involved um, without their time and dedication participating in you know whether it's monarch tagging or bumblebee watch or snake project or some other non-b project that's out there um, but i think Nebraska, maybe I'm just too involved in this. I almost feel like our state is ahead in community science in some ways, because we do have the community science network of Nebraska. And we do have a specific community science position from the Game and Parks Agency. And Cody does all this work on community science projects in the state. And, you know, we have a moth project run by the Crane Trust and the Bumblebee Out. Like there's so many community science projects and the Master Naturalist program is awesome. Like it's hard to envision how it could be better, but obviously there are many ways it could be better. Is that everybody? Did everyone get a chance to answer that question? That was a really good one. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to our panelists and to our excellent host. Um, I saw a lot of uh, questions in the chat, just excited to get participating. And so one thing I put in is that, like um, Katie mentioned, there is a Community Scientists of Nebraska network, and they do have a project directory. And there's um, many ways that you can get involved um, from the facilitator to the participant and everything in between. Um, and as Katie mentioned too, Allie Mays is, it's, it's really exciting. She is our community science um, education specialist of the state of, or at least for our agency. And so if you have any questions at all and you're not sure where to get started, she's a really good point of contact to just kind of help put you into the places of where you might, um, where you might be involved. Um, so again, thank you so much. This was a fantastic discussion. Allie, what'd you think? Was this good? Good discussion? I loved it. Loved it. Yes. I wanted to, I want, I kind of want to ask like seven more questions. So maybe we'll have to do this again next year. Um, but thanks again, everybody, just to let you know, I will be sending out an email evaluation tomorrow. And I was typing in all the resources everyone was uh, chatting about. And so I'll probably have a really long list of resources to send you and everybody's contact information too, if you have more particular questions about anything that anyone said today. So thanks for participating and have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you, panelists. And thank you, Allie. Thank you. Bye.